Now, one of the things that, uh, Kirsu, you, you, right before you went live, you said, hey, have you heard about this thing with, this, with Assassin's Creed Shadows? And we're like, what are you talking yeah. about? So fill us in here. This is from that park place where they yeah. have hired this LGBTQ, LGBTQ oh, yeah. activist. Yeah, they hired this woman. Uh, I was going to talk about this on my stream, but I hadn't gotten to it. Her name is Sachi Schmidt Hori. She looks and like people... she's about to lure Flash Gordon into a space trap in that photo. Yeah. Are you seeing it? Yeah, so she was she was one of the consultants that worked on <clears throat> the game and she is also an associate professor at Dartmouth University. Okay. Um her biography states that she's an activist and she says I am interested in investigating how gender, sexuality, corporality, and power are represented and negotiated in pre-17th century Japanese narratives and illustrations. My first book, Tales of Idolized Boys, Male-Male Love in Medieval Japanese Narratives, is on medieval Ichigo Monogatari, Buddhist acolyte tales, which often depict romantic relationships between Buddhist priests and adolescent boys. Oh, these tales all... challenge, yeah. These tales challenge a host of normative and moral standards we academics, especially, internalize, I, including such ideas as sexual orientation, transgenerational sex, and sexual agency. And her book is very long. Is that what they're calling it now? By the way, transgenerational sex is really. So, so tra I had to look that up because I was like, "What is transgenerational sex?" They're like Doc Brown shows up with a friggin' <laughs> box of condoms. What? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's when like if if the Buddhist monk had relationships with adolescent boys, then that mood that Buddhist monk, if they had offspring would be predisposed to both liking adolescent boys and homosexuality. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I've got a simple, small, small, tiny question. Just tiny yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. What does this have to do with a game about ninjas in Japan? Uh, I mean, I guess she's part Japanese, so they were like, "All hey, right, you, all right. you clearly, you clearly know what you're talking about." Okay. I, I, you, you think Ubisoft even know they're making a game at this point? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, wow. my God. And she she talks about um, why she was doing this kind of investigation in the, in the first place. Uh, and in her book, which it's like 200 and something pages, it's way too much to read. But part of her book says, A seed for this research was planted in my heart when I was 9 or 10, Throughout my childhood, my mother implicitly demonstrated to me how the covert, unspoken rules of human relations could play out in our lives. During the 1980s, my mother, a young single parent of three, worked at a nightclub and in a Kabu Kabukicho, an entertainment and red light district of Tokyo. Instead of driving a cab, authoring novels, treating cancer patients, or teaching math, my mother dressed impeccably and entertained her patrons after their long, stressful workdays. She regarded these men not only as the source of her income, but also friends and allies. And unusual, or as unusual as my childhood was, I was generally content with the choice my mother made in order to keep a roof over our heads and save money for the future. Strangers, however, were less willing to accept someone like my mother as an ordinary citizen. Neighbors and my schoolmates, parents, tended to see her as simultaneously sleazy, pietous, and angelic. Sleazy, because of an inexplicable, though not uncommon in Japan, contempt for women who use any amount of their sexuality to make a living. Pietous, for enduring such a shameful act as working as a, a hostess. And angelic, for debasing herself out of love for her children. Although I always found these sentiments equally absurd and infuriating, my mother never seemed to pay attention to the moral crusaders who wished a more respectable job upon her. And then the clincher here which would have meant the acceptance of a huge pay cut. So this woman is coming from the position that it's okay to do this kind of work because otherwise you would have to accept less money for quote-unquote regular jobs. No, because otherwise she'd have to accept that her mom was a whore. Yeah. Like that's, that's what's going on there. There's even abiding denial here is what's going yeah. on. Holy buckets. Yeah, I had heard some of this. I had not realized how deep the vein went. That's yeah, she, she talks about age as a social construct in regards to the adolescent boy and adult monk relation, relationships as well. 
And it's crazy that she's just like, look, we can come in and look at these things objectively, just like historians do with war. War happens and, and we can cover it without having to feel icky. But then she goes on to make like long defenses of it and compare it to like uh, age gap relationships and homosexuality right. today. And it's just like, what are you doing, lady? I mean, really, what this comes down to is this lady, she doesn't have daddy issues. She, as you said, she has mommy issues, right? She has yeah. issues with a one parent household where her mom was, you know, spread her leg, leg, legs wider than, you know, the freaking canal. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and, and she, she's trying to justify her mom sucking that dick. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> That's true. What blabs the actual, actual father? Dick. Yeah, there we go. That's right. <laughs> right. Lots of a dick. That's right. It's crazy. Uh, Thanks, Malik. <laughs> well, and, and and now she is being rewarded for that now. This has become her profession. No, she's she's getting rewarded because she's not from America or Britain or particularly what like that's why at the end of the day. Like yeah. she's being rewarded for her ethnicity because Ubisoft have quotas. That's just how that works. Wow. You and, know, I and Good, I, I was about to say, IGN had an interview with her, and in IGN's little article, they introduce her as Sachi Schmidt Hori, a professor of Japanese literature and culture. Wait, her mom Ubisoft. was a whore and her last name is Hori? Yes, I, I know. It, <laughs> the jokes write themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's like dick butt kiss. What is it going is. on here? All right. <laughs> She was like, working with Ubisoft on Assassin's Creed Shadows, uh, Sachi Schmidt Hori says, Yasuke has been featured in many creative writings and media. If you go to Wikipedia for Yasuke's page, there's a long, long list of novels, TV series, and dramas that have been inspired by him. He's a historical character or somebody who was inspired by him. I think people in Japan really, really embrace him as a character, and we really like to see him representing the samurai spirit. And it's just like, how do you call her uh, like a, a literature and culture person when she writes about the positivity of adolescent adult male relationships? Well, it makes uh, I'm more so. I mean, isn't she going to have to write side quests? How is this going to go? Because it's not like this is an unfamiliar practice in feudal Japan or in any country. Yeah. You know, during their feudal periods. Like, yeah. What? What's gonna what's gonna creep into the script here? I wonder. That's kind of what I'm more alarmed about. Yasuke gonna pick up some of those child brides along the way, you know? Like... Right. I don't <laughs> know, man. Wow. Well, this is uh, you know, some quick research on her. Uh, she is, you know, you mentioned Dartmouth, right? And Dartmouth is mm -hmm. is Ivy League, and we see what's happening over there. Um, you know, with all their bravery. Uh. uh it's uh, it's really amazing to see how these people find their way into the video game space. Like, who approached who in this situation? Did Ubisoft approach her? Did she approach Ubisoft? I'm guessing it was probably her approaching Ubisoft and her doing the whole like, uh, what was the what was the thing with Sweet Baby Inc. where they they threaten you and they say, hey, you know, let let them know. Let them know how, how bad it's going to get if they don't Maybe, do maybe not. If they got hiring quotas and they have diversity quotas, then automatically the first thing, and nobody talks about this, this, is for, this goes for anything, government agencies, bureaucracies, the first thing that takes a hit is the quality of the candidates that are actually hired. Back, if, I, if I can go back to the, uh, the woman's book for a second, there's a citation Please. in here. Uh, one of her citations for her book is from a book called Sex and Harm in the Age of Consent by Joseph J. Fischel uh, from Minneapolis University of Minnesota Press in 2016. And it says, Although sex offenders certainly include those who are attracted to young children, Fischel's primary focus is adults who develop mutual attractions and form sexual relationships with teenagers. His analysis on the recent shift in the American legal system and media representations, as in positive portrayals of LGBTQ individuals and the demonization of transgenerational sexuality, is applicable to how contemporary scholarship on the Chigo system and Chigo tales switched its focal point from the same sexness of the relationships to the age difference. So what he's saying is, is that people went from a homophobic attitude towards Chigo to now focusing on the age difference instead. And it's like, it, 
It always should have been on the age difference. What do you mean? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of like putting the emphasis in the Norm Macdonald, Michael Jackson jokes on the homosexual <laughs> pedophile. Yeah, right? like, no, I think I think the pedophile <laughs> says it all. <laughs> wow. Oh, someone in chat asked, what's Chigo? Chigo are what the male prepubescent children who had sexual relationships with monks were called. So in the book, she tries comparing them to how like in in Europe as well, uh, children were, you know, put on a pedestal. They they were the fruit of the family, how you would continue your lineage. And the same was true in Japan. Your children were like a bargaining chip and you, you could use them to sort of get ahead in life, have your children get ahead in life by giving them like religious symbolism or if they were enshrined as like a, a child emperor. And so letting the monks have sexual access to your children apparently was one of the ways you could get them some kind of status in the society. I don't know enough to be able to prove this woman right or wrong on that point. I, I have a... a wood chipper named status, if they would. Yeah, like right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I mean, we we all know that those things happened like way back then, like you said earlier, Razor. But it, it's right. just like, obviously, in current year, we wouldn't encourage that kind of thing. Like this book seems to be going down. So this lady is involved in Assassin's Creed. I yeah, think yeah, she's, yeah. she's a consultant for Assassin's Creed for some reason. Can't wait for a half-assed version of Ghost of Tsushima written by <laughs> Pedo Pete and the preteen Pooper Posse, whatever. And clearly, clearly the number one authority on Japanese culture. Oh my god. Wow. God. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Uh, hey, yeah, uh, hey, you Craig. Knowledge. Hey, Craig. Is there anything else we can talk about? Anything else in the Helios? Yeah, literally anything. System? Like. <laughs>